Good afternoon and welcome to the Minnesota Senate Commerce and Consumer Protection Committee. Today is Tuesday, February 14th, 2023, and it is 12.34 p.m. Uh, a quorum is present. First bill before us this afternoon, members of the committee, is Senate File 23. Senator Dibble, to your bill. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members, for the opportunity to present Senate File 23. I'd also like to take the opportunity to thank my co-authors, uh, Senator Mann, Senator May Quaid, Senator Umu Verbaten, and Senator Gustafson. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, simply put, Senate File 23 would ban the practice of coercing young people into conversion therapy by licensed practitioners. But I have to say that therapy is a generous term in this context uh, because it is a treatment or a practice that is not only ineffective, it causes great harm. It has long been discredited and denounced by responsible and credible practitioners of medical and mental health care. Um, I won't go into statements unless you're interested later, but uh, um, there are very strong statements on the part of a vast array of professional associations, including the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Psychiatric Association, the American Psychological Association, that strongly advise against uh, making use of this so-called therapy for the reasons that I just stated. It's ineffective and it causes great harm. It includes an array of practices that seeks to persuade or induce an individual into believing their sexual orientation or gender identity or expression has been changed. And this is shown to be impossible. The true effect is to communicate to that person that they are disordered, who they are is wrong it is sinful, that causes damage in the form of depression, decreased self-esteem, substance abuse, self-harm, and suicide. This industry preys on people's fears and does irreparable harm to young people. What brings Senate File 23 to this committee is because it would also prevent parents and others from being misled and deceived by the agents of the conversion therapy industry so that it would prevent false representations, misrepresentation, um, and deceptive trade practices and the like. So to be clear, uh, Mr. Chair, um, the bill does not reach into religious practice or belief or any practice or form of prayer in that realm. The restrictions apply only to paid professional services and those who would advertise the agents of those services. Mr. Chair and members, 20 states, Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, and 75 cities, including a number of them here in Minnesota, have taken this step to protect their young people. In July of 2021, Governor Wall signed an executive order in an attempt to curtail the practice, but as we know, executive orders are limited in their reach and they expire. So, Mr. Chair, the time is long past due when we should be affirming in this state to all people, including LGBTQ people, and let them know they are perfect as they are. Welcome to show up wherever they're wanted, wherever they are needed, as good, as fully human, and to bring the entirety of their talents to every endeavor. We would all be richer for that. Um, so Mr. Chair, um, I'm happy to respond to questions at this point, or um, we have a few folks who would like to testify on the bill. Thank you, Senator Dibble. I think it would be good to call forth your testifiers. Great. I don't have the list, so I'll let them figure out who comes up in what order. <laughs> we'll start with Kat Roan. Thank you for coming to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Senator Dibble, Chair Klein, and committee members. My name is Kat Roan, and I serve as Executive Director for Outfront Minnesota, our state's largest LGBTQ advocacy organization. I come to testify in support of SF23. It is critical that when Minnesotans seek support from counselors, therapists, and practitioners, we can be assured that we will receive competent, effective, evidence-based care. 
protecting vulnerable Minnesotans from the harms of the widely discredited practice of so-called conversion therapy will bring our state in line with the clear consensus of the medical community, and it will send a message to LGBTQ plus Minnesotans that we are cared for and celebrated for who we are. There is real cost to not addressing these harmful practices. Youth subjected to conversion therapy experience lifelong impacts on their mental health and are at increased risk for suicide and substance abuse. These have significant economic implications for individuals in our state. And I have heard countless experiences from survivors that express the deep and lasting harm of these practices on individual lives. It is crucial that we protect Minnesota's consumers from harmful and ineffective practices that masquerade as care. Minnesotans are ready to end this practice. Over the past couple of years, the Twin Cities, as well as places like Duluth, Red Wing, Northfield, Winona, and others, have already recognized the harms caused by these practices and enacted their own municipal bans. We also thank the governor for his 2021 executive order on this issue. These are steps forward. But now is the time for statewide legislative action. I consider myself fortunate to have been embraced and affirmed by my family and my community in my personal journey. It's allowed me to thrive as a person, as a parent, as a professional, and that is an experience that I want for every member of our state's LGBTQ plus community. This is one more step towards that reality. To our state's LGBTQ youth, Know that you are perfect just the way you are. Let's take this important step to protect youth and vulnerable adults from these harmful practices. I urge you to advance this bill. Thank you. Well, thank you for your testimony. Next will be Representative Hunter Cantrell. Welcome to the committee, Representative. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Hunter Cantrell. I am a former state representative, uh, and I'm here today to voice my strong support for Senator Dibble's bill to ban the harmful, fraudulent practice of LGBTQ plus conversion therapy in the state of Minnesota. This bill is the culmination of years of refinement to ensure that not one more child, excuse me, or vulnerable adult will suffer the devastating practice of conversion therapy in our state, and that all Minnesotans are protected from the charlatans who would seek to deceive patients and families into thinking that there is some cure for being gay or trans, or that such a cure is necessary. I am gay, and being gay, trans, non-binary, and in fact, every identity within our big, beautiful LGBTQ plus community is not something to be suppressed, rather in the spirit of love, compassion, and our shared human dignity, should be uplifted and protected. This is especially true within that dynamic of patient care. As healthcare practitioners, uh, one of whom I shall be one day as I'm a future physician myself, should be held to the highest standards of care given the trust that the public has placed in them and should practice based not on prejudice or bias, but in the pursuit of empowering patients to live their full authentic lives in accordance with best professional practices. Conversion therapy is being practiced throughout our state to this very day and at this very moment. Fundamentally, you as a legislature have a constitutional right and a legal responsibility to regulate commerce and prohibit deceitful, harmful promotion of goods and services to protect members of the public, especially children and vulnerable adults, from deceptive and demonstrably damaging actions that pose a threat to public health and safety. There is no First Amendment right to harm people, let alone children, nor does the First Amendment preclude the state from regulating the unethical and dangerous conduct of healthcare practitioners. In fact, the state has a long history of regulating practices in healthcare as a means to protect the public. In close, please vote in favor of passing this bill today so that future generations of children and their families can be permanently protected from the harm of LGBTQ plus conversion therapy in Minnesota. And LGBTQ plus people of all ages may know that they are perfect just the way they are. They do not need to be fixed and they deserve to be treated with dignity. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Dibble, for everything. Thank you, Representative. Uh, next will be Dr. Marge Charmoli. Mm -hmm. 
Hello, um, Chairperson Klein and members of the committee. My name is Dr. Margaret Charmley. I'm a licensed psychologist, and I am here to testify on behalf of the Minnesota Psychological Association in conjunction with the American Psychological Association. We support Senate File 23. Psychologists are primary arbiters of what constitutes psychological disorders as well as effective therapy. Our understanding of sexual orientation and gender identity has evolved for over 50 years as a result of scientific search, clinical observations, and study. Our position is that being gay, lesbian, bisexual, and or transgender is not a psychological disorder or mental illness. As such, it doesn't require treatment to fix or change it. Therefore, the purpose and promise of conversion therapy is fraudulent and based on false and deceptive premises, beliefs, and information. It is unethical for psychologists to render services under those conditions. Furthermore, conversion therapy or efforts to change sexual orientation or gender identity are unlikely to work and are associated with harm and serious risks, including but not limited to suicide attempts and completions, depression, anxiety, and substance abuse. We understand that some people have more fluid sexual orientations or gender identities that may evolve naturally over time, but not as a result of willful manipulation or attempts to change. For example, the largest segment, 57%, of the LGBTQ community identifies as bisexual, which likely explains the reported changes that some people experience in their sexual orientation. Senate File 23 does not prevent licensed mental health providers from talking with their clients about their sexual orientation or gender identity. It does not limit their freedom of speech. It only requires that they practice according to acceptable standards of care. For those who may experience distress about their identities, that includes helping them explore their options, understand the stress of being part of a marginalized and stigmatized group, develop positive coping skills, nurture resilience, seek social support, and get accurate information about sexual orientation and gender identity. These approaches have been shown to be effective, evidence-based practices that are associated with positive outcomes in therapy. Thank you very much for your time, and thank you, Senator Dibble. For thank you, Doctor. Last is Emily Pyle from the Trevor Project. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Emily Pyle, and I'm here today testifying on behalf of the Trevor Project, the world's largest suicide prevention and crisis intervention organization for LGBTQ youth. In Minnesota, we served over 3,900 contacts last year, which we estimate is just a portion of about 32,000 LGBTQ youth in Minnesota who seriously consider suicide. To further our mission of ending LGBTQ youth suicide, Trevor is dedicated to seeing the end of practices commonly referred to as conversion therapy. We stand with every reputable medical and mental health organization in condemning these practices as harmful, ineffective, unethical, and founded on unscientific theories that have been debunked for decades. At Trevor, we have direct experience and extensive research observing the dangers of these practices. In our 2022 national survey, which reflects responses from more than 30,000 LGBTQ young people, we found that 6% reported experiencing conversion therapy and another 11% reported being threatened with it. Those youth who either experienced or were threatened with conversion therapy were more than twice as likely to report a suicide attempt in the past year. Our counselors don't ask about conversion therapy directly when a youth calls us in crisis, but in the last year, 1,300 contacts from more than 600 cities across the U.S. raised the topic themselves. And finally, these practices also have drastic financial impacts on families and our country. In 2022, a peer-reviewed journal of the American Medical Association used health economics to find the annual direct cost of conversion therapy in the U.S. to be $650 million. Worse, the indirect costs associated with conversion therapy, like treating depression, suicide attempts, et cetera, totals more than $8 billion. Thank you so much for taking up this important issue and acting to protect young people from these dangerous practices. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any members of the public who would like to testify on Senate File 23? Seeing none, we'll go now to member questions and comments. And uh, members of the committee, 
this bill has already passed through the Health and Human Services Committee. It will go from here to the Senate floor. The area of the bill that requires our attention is Section 3, which deals with advertising. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the committee members? Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, uh, and thank you, Senator Dibble. I have a question for the bill author uh, that relates specifically to Section 3 here in the bill. Um, I've seen other uh, conversion therapy laws that have passed throughout the country, but this feature where it is going beyond um, regulating healthcare professionals and how they can engage in their relationships with patients and the types of therapy that they can offer. Uh, this I couldn't find another analog to in terms of other states that have put a ban on advertising and sales, uh, could include books or, or other type of material. And so my question, Mr. Chair, for the bill author, is there any other state that has, has adopted this into law? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Senator Grasmussen, um, I'm not familiar with with all of the laws, I'm not, but to, to answer your question, I'm not familiar with any other state that has um, has this this kind of thing specifically. I do believe there are some uh, regulations around misrepresentation of the efficacy of of conversion therapy um, and uh, and uh, you know false statements about uh, uh, what is and isn't a mental disease or disorder or illness, et cetera. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and. Uh, Thank you, Senator Dibble. A follow-up question on that. You know, when I read through this language, I mean, if, if Amazon or a local Minnesota bookstore were to uh, publish a book that had a certain point of view, whether that was on um, gender identity or sexual orientation, could you see this language uh, preventing the sale of, of such a book in Minnesota if it was deemed to be promoting uh, conversion therapy as defined in your bill? Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question, Senator Rasmussen. And I believe the answer to your question would be no. Um, the language is, uh, I think, specifically drawn to uh, you know those who provide conversion therapy and advertise it as you know as a service for sale um, and falsely misrepresenting its effectiveness. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I appreciate the answer, uh, Senator Dibble. Um, my concern is, you know, when I look at the Section 3, uh, just really frankly comes down to First Amendment right concerns, where when I read um, on line 216, it says, no person or ent entity shall while conducting any trade or commerce. Um, and you know, to me, this is, uh, reads to be very, very broad language that could potentially be used to uh, discriminate against certain viewpoints that, uh, you or I may disagree with, um, but uh, uh, could still be a part of our, an individual's First Amendment rights to be able to um, have a point of view and to have that point of view, dis you know, disseminated. Um, and so that would just be, you know, one concern I have with with this section and how it relates to an individual's First Amendment rights. Mr. Chair, Senator Dibble. Uh, thank you, Senator Rasmus, and I appreciate your uh, perspective. Um, however, uh, to reassure you. Um, you would have to read through the entirety of the section and the sentence. Um, and what it is drawn to is um, false or misleading statements or deceptive practice by advertising or otherwise offering conversion therapy services. Um, so it's specifically drawn to false, misleading, deceptive trade practices that would offer a service that simply is ineffective and causes harm in misrepresenting that would be a deceptive trade practice, and I think it is within the public's interest, and it is you know a sound public policy um, to prevent that from occurring. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a question of the bill author: Who would enforce Section Three of this bill if there is uh, someone who you know was was violating this in some way? How would, what's the enforcement mechanism for Section Three? Senator Dibble. Um, Good question, Senator Rasmussen. I don't actually know. I mean, I hope people would police themselves and uh, and not engage in uh, law-breaking activity. Um, if it were to occur, um, I'm sure there is someone uh, who, uh, who would who would enforce Section 325F.69, but I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know if council can help or 
our chair who knows everything about everything commerce could help. Mr. Hudala. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I believe the answer to that question is the Attorney General. I think in uh, Section 8.31 of the Minnesota Statutes, it gives the AG the ability to enforce the section. Um, I don't know that for certain, so let me check, and I will get back to you, Senator Rasmussen, on that point. Senator Rasmussen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess this is a question for you, uh, Mr. Chair, is what's the, the next committee stop for this bill? Is this going to be going to Judiciary and Civil Law? Senator Rasmussen, this will go to uh, General Orders. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and appreciate that. Appreciate the conversation on Section 3, and I would just say, you know, given the conversation today around having the Attorney General involved, you know, I think sending it to Senator Latt's committee might be a good idea, but um, appreciate your prerogative on that. Mr. Hudal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and Senator, I did just pull up uh, Section 8.31, and uh, the Attorney General does have uh, enforcement authority over this over um, the applicable section. And to the chair of the Judiciary Committee, Senator Lattes. Uh Mr. Chairman, Senator Rasmussen, uh, we don't hear bills in the Judiciary Committee just because the Attorney General's office has the statutory authority to enforce. Um, all the consumer protection bills, I think, are fall in that same category. Um, so uh, this is not something Judiciary Committee would view as within its jurisdiction based on that. Any follow-up or any other Member, questions or comments? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, uh, Senator Dibble. I just have uh, just a couple questions for you. Uh, I'm supportive of your bill as it uh, pertains to sexual orientation. I have some questions uh, that have to do with other aspects of the bill, specifically those that might be um, questioning uh, their gender or seeking to maybe transition or something to that effect. And I've done some research to look at other laws that are on the books or might be being considered in other states. And the reason I, I raise the question is um, some of the feedback I've heard specific to this bill or um, conversion therapy and what, we, what, what isn't allowed by the state is you have some very well-intentioned uh, health professionals that sometimes feel that they don't know what their left and right limits are, so to speak, when they do seek to help somebody who is undergoing this process or just has questions about it. And for fear of running afoul of the law, uh, instead of providing what would sometimes be very helpful, very useful information, consultations, answering of questions, uh, they choose not to because they, they don't want to be found in violation of the law. And I'll, I'll give you an example of a bill out of another state very briefly that speaks to this a little bit. Uh, part of their bill states this, a healthcare professional who is not intending to change a minor client's sexual orientation or gender identity or to impose a different sexual orientation or gender identity upon a minor client may engage in a professional and lawful conduct, including a practice or treatment by which the healthcare professional, and then it lists a few things, is neutral with respect to this matter, provides a minor client with acceptance, support, understanding, um, and it lists probably a dozen or so things in which a healthcare professional knows exactly what they can or can't do on behalf of that person, most often a minor, um, so that they are still getting some help. And then additionally, it goes on to say that the section does not apply to someone who's both a healthcare professional and a religious advisor, uh, an individual who's both a healthcare professional and a parent or grandparent. And I know that there's a portion of the bill that seems to get at that a little bit, but not in the same level of specificity. So I guess my question to you would be, um, is, is adding that level of specificity or uh, seeking to spell it out a little bit more, anything that you would give consideration to as it pertains to this bill? Thank you. Senator Dibble. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the question, Senator Duckworth. Um, I, I mean, I think uh, if you were to, to read the uh, first paragraph of the bill, um, I think we say the same thing just in a different way. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's fairly specific. Um, you know, it says that, uh, um, you know, it, it says, you know, what conversion therapy is. And just to be clear, members, um, you know, conversion therapy is, is an attempt uh, to change someone's sexual orientation or gender identity or expression. Um, that is 
a literal impossibility, and that creates great harm, as we heard in testimony from the professionals earlier. Um, it does not include counseling that provides assistance to someone who's undergoing transition um, or someone um, who's, who's looking uh, for, better, for greater acceptance, better understanding, uh, better coping, support, exploration, development, um, et cetera. Um, so, um, you know, I know, I know our, our temptation often as we write legislation um, is to really drill down and, and be very specific. Um, sometimes that causes us to overshoot the mark a little bit, I think. Um, and I think with very simple language, it's elegant, and I think it gets precisely to the points that you raise. Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senator Dibble. Uh, I understand it can seem like we're splitting hairs to an extent here when it comes to what you just said and, and what I said earlier. I would say, I, I guess to me, one of the differences, uh, defining what it is not, there's value. I see that it does add some clarity. Um, but then to take it a step further and say specifically what they are allowed to do or what wouldn't be considered something uh, that would have them be uh, in violation of this law, um, from their perspective, would add another degree of specificity that I think may, there may be some value to. So I'll, it's your bill. I'm certainly not going to debate it with you. It looks like you, you've attempted to do that. Uh, but just one thing for consideration and from hearing with folks who you know, deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis, having very clear cut, a very clear-cut understanding or a list of, uh, of guidelines or things that they, that they know without a doubt they can do or help folks with. I think might be helpful. Uh, that's all I've got. Thank you. Response? Um, thank you, uh, and I appreciate that, and I'm perfectly happy to speak with you more as we make our way to the floor uh, on, on that idea. Um, you know, it does beg the question, why not just leave this all to the professional licensure boards and leave it to the uh, professions to police themselves? Um, uh, you know, why are we legislating this sort of thing? Um, in my response to that, I know that wasn't your question, but it does kind of, it's kind of out there looming as a question. Um, my response to that is twofold. One is, um, uh, well, threefold. One is that um, this rises to the level of harm that it is in the public's interest uh, to ensure that it doesn't occur. Um, we do that in a number of other areas in protecting those who don't have legal standing or personal agency. And so this is, Put, trying to give some protection for um, people under 18 as well as vulnerable adults. Secondly, um, it might be getting better, but in recent history, the professions have done a very poor job of policing themselves um, and been very reluctant to move into this area. Um, I hope they're getting better. Maybe they are. Our psychologists can tell us if that's true or not. Third, um, in, those in, in some states where um, uh, that has been the direction and or you know, direction given in the executive branch to the licensing boards. Activists, extremists, right-wing legislatures have moved against that as well. So giving us the foundation and law to make sure that this doesn't happen um, uh, is very, very important. And uh, Mr. Chair, while I'm thinking about it, um, this is, coming, uh, this is you know, coming at a moment in which we see literally over 300 bills being introduced across the country that would move very aggressively um, to harm LGBTQ people, particularly transgender people, um, to seek to erase them from existence, to deny their humanity and their dignity. Um, we are in a moment in which it's very, very important for this state to stand up for the values that it holds dear, and that is everyone is a citizen. Everyone has the right to be treated with respect and love and dignity and is shown to be welcome in this state. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Dibble. Thank you, Senator Dibble. Other member questions or comments? Senator Dibble, thank you for bringing this bill. I have just a couple of comments from the chair. Um, it's uh, very moving for me to be the final stop for this bill on its way to the Senate floor and to becoming law in the state of uh, Minnesota. Um, this is the Commerce Committee, uh, and I know you've already been through the Health and Human Services Committee, but I want to make a few comments in my unique role as a health care practitioner. Um, as a father, as a physician, and as a friend, this is the right thing to do for all Minnesotans. The history of medical practice is littered with barbaric practices that have left a stain on the profession and on humanity. Uh, leeches for infections, 
uh, lobotomy for psychiatric illnesses, the willful practice of prescribing morphine for hysteria in women. This bill, once in effect, and this practice once eliminated, will join those dark annals of medical history. Uh, as a physician, I'd like to take this moment to apologize to the people of Minnesota who have been victimized by this practice. And I would like to reaffirm your statement that they are perfect, that the way they were made, and all Minnesotans uh, should know that. Uh, and with that, uh, Senator Dibble, <coughs> the question is on the motion of Senator Wickland that Senate File 23 be recommended to pass and sent to the Senate floor. All in favor say aye. aye. Opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senate File 23 is recommended to pass and is sent to the Senate floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members. Thank you, Ms. Senator Dibble. Next up is Senate File 998, Senator Zhang. Senator Zhang, welcome to the committee. Your uh, bill is before us. Um, please speak to the bill. Uh, th good afternoon, Chair and uh, members. Uh, I have here uh, Senate File 998. Uh, it is the Minnesota Student Loan Advocate Bill. Uh, I am urging you to support this legislation uh, as I am working with uh, longtime advocates and stakeholders, and I am proud to continue the work of those uh, such as Senator Duckworth um, and, and others to help find a solution to the student loan debt crisis here in Minnesota. Um, Senate File 998 directs the Commissioner of Commerce to designate a student loan advocate with the Department of Commerce to provide uh, assistance and effectuate support for student loan borrowers. Uh, this bill is a critical step towards ensuring that our state's students and recent graduates uh, receive the support and guidance they need to navigate the complex and overwhelming world of student loan debt. Uh, as one of uh, the children born in the 90s, uh, like Senator Rasmussen and myself here, uh, the cost for college education uh, for both two-year and four-year four colleges are different from what they were 20 to 30 years ago. Uh, you know, there's a statistics that's saying that uh, average Minnesota college, gra uh, college graduate debt uh, ranges well over $30,000 a year. And as we all know, student loan debt has reached unprecedented levels. And so this bill helps the Department of Commerce to tackle this issue uh, with the student loan advocate. Um, to provide expert assistance uh, to borrowers in Minnesota, helping them to navigate the loan system, negotiate with lenders, and access loan forgiveness and assistance programs. Because uh, one of the key issues for students, uh, student borrowers is that, you know, they just really just don't know where they can receive help uh, and avoid some of the later pitfalls that lies ahead. Um, and so this would help be one of the more permanent uh, solutions to help uh, with this issue. And as a state, we have a responsibility to support our students and recent graduates to help uh, build their lives and careers and to continue the fight uh, and create a competitive global workforce right here in Minnesota. And with this bill, we can make a meaningful difference. And I thank you to this important attention to this issue and I urge you to support this bill. Um, and I have with me a testifier. Thank you, Senator Zhang. Uh, Ms. Wendy Drugi, uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Hi, my name is Wendy Drugi Winch, and I am the teacher union president in the Burnsville Public Schools, and I've been a teacher for 26 years. So um, I wanted to be here today to share some experiences that my members of my union have had with their student loans. I support Senate File 998 and the creation of a student loan advocate in Minnesota. Without having support and assistance in navigating an incredibly difficult student loan repayment system, borrowers like my fellow teachers and the students that we teach 
will continue to struggle under the weight of loans that we pay back for years. One of the hardest parts of my job for the past several years is having conversations with fellow educators who are leaving their profession, not because they want to leave teaching, but because I can tell you that one of the factors that they're struggling with is the student loan debt and feeling overwhelmed by the enormity of it. I want to share a few examples of educators who have helped, who have needed help navigating their student loans to illustrate why it is so important for Minnesota to have an advocate in place. Many of my colleagues should qualify for federal loan forgiveness programs like the teacher loan forgiveness and public service loan forgiveness but they find it impossible to get accurate information on how to apply. They have expressed frustration at getting contradictory information or being rejected on technicalities that were never shared. These complaints are coming from people who have been diligent and repeatedly reached out for help. I've heard from others who tried to get accurate loan payment history data from loan servicers, but finding that because of transfers, or other oversights, they cannot get a complete record of their past payments. I know educators who have tried to find out how to lower their monthly payments and should have been evaluated for an income-driven repayment plan to lower their payments, but that option was never mentioned. Too many people are put into forbearance to stop their payments, while interest compounds on their debt because the process is easier for loan servicers rather than helping them get into affordable repayment plans. There are educators who were advised by loan servicers to refinance their debt into private loans, making them ineligible for any loan forgiveness and subject to difficult private lending rules. We are facing a severe educator shortage, and it is so difficult to see all the students who are deciding not to go into teaching because they do not believe they will be able to afford to repay loans on a teacher's salary. We can and should make it easier for our students to choose any career path and invest in their education to get there. All Minnesotans deserve to have accurate and clear information on loan repayment options. All Minnesotans deserve the financial security that comes from having an even playing field so they can repay their debts and build a strong financial future. This bill would help by ensuring that as borrowers, there is someone on your side to help us avoid the abuses in the student lending system. I hope you will support this bill and help not just the students and staff in my district, but all Minnesota borrowers. Thank you. And, uh, oh, sorry, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Drugi. Senator Zhang. Um, thank you, Wendy. And uh, Chair, there's a letter from the Office of the Attorney General's Office uh, discussing and a couple of other letters uh, in support of this legislation and some of the folks we work with on this bill. Thank you. Senator Zhang, we'll go now to uh, member questions and comments. Seeing none, Senator Zhang. Sorry, Senator, Senator Dames, my apologies. Um, I know, oh, thank you, Chair. Um, I know that the uh, Office of Higher Education has also been working with the student uh, loan servicing, but um, other than that, I don't. I don't. Uh, I would think the uh, the Attorney General would have authority over this too. Senator Dames. <clears throat> Senator John. Chair, uh, Chair Klein, uh, Senator Dames. No, the student loan uh, advocate would be focused more um, with some would, would be someone with expertise in this specific area in uh, focusing on predatory lending and providing uh, support for students. And uh, the Office of Higher Ed would is more um, focused on the you know, set up of the program itself, and maybe the Office of Higher, Higher Ed can probably provide more information on it. Senator Deems. A follow-up, Mr. Chair. So under the new, under this program, you have that under the Department of Commerce, is that correct? Yes. A follow-up, Mr. Chair. 
Okay. Senator Deems. And so would that program then, what authority would, would that uh, person have to resolve these issues and these complaints under the Department of Commerce? Senator Deems. Um, the student loan advocate in the Department of Commerce um, Senator they would have, uh, the chair. My chair apologies, Klein. can I interrupt yes. you? Yeah, I believe you may have a friend that can assist yeah. you. At, uh, oh, yes, from the Congress. Mr. Kelly, uh, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, uh, for the record, I'm John Kelly. I'm the Director of Government Affairs for the Department of Commerce. Um, so uh, currently, under the state law, we have the Student Loan Borrower Bill of Rights. Uh, this is an expansion of that to add the ombudsman. But right now, under 58B, the Commerce Department has the enforcement authority around student loan servicers. Our financial institutions division does examinations and our enforcement division would do investigations. Thank you, Mr. Senator Dames. Okay, thank you. Any other member questions or comments? Senator Duckworth. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is for Mr. Kelly. So if the, if the, it's, it's the uh, department's assessment that even though you have folks that, that handle and, and do this currently, that you need to bring on this particular uh, person as well, or how would that, how would this person differentiate or allow you guys to do more effectively or, or to do better what you're currently doing, I guess, is my question. Senator, uh, Mr. Kelly. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Duckworth. So uh, the Department of Commerce is not bringing this bill forward, but we have uh, done the fiscal note on this bill. Um, this is uh, always been, at least in my understanding, as long as this has been around at the legislature, part of the Student Loan Borrower Bill of Rights. It was kind of a two-piece uh, there, the, the first half went, and now they are wanting to add the ombudsman. Um, I think this is a, a similar uh, kind of role to what we currently have in senior financial fraud prevention. Um, you may have seen the Star Tribune article this week. We have civil and criminal enforcement of senior financial fraud, but we also have an ombudsman who is point on dealing with those claims and also providing critical outreach and information about folks' rights and uh, responsibilities uh, are under that law. And I think this is pretty similar to that. Um, so that's our understanding of this role. It is not only to handle the complaints and work on the complaints, but also there is, and it's in the fiscal note, uh, an educational uh, component to it as well. Seeing no further uh, member questions or comments, Senator Zhang, any final closing comments on your bill? No, I appreciate your support, members. And seeing that, uh, the question is on the motion of Senator Seberger that Senate File 998 be recommended to pass and then refer to the Committee on Higher Education. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed, say no. No. The motion prevails. Senate File 998 is recommended to pass and refer to the Committee on Higher Education. Thank you, Senator Zhang. If you can remain at the table and tell us about Senate File 1461, which is now before the Committee. Uh, Senator Klein, uh, thank you, members. Uh, next is Senate File 4 1461. Uh, I think here no one uh, questions the need for student Minnesota uh, students to understand economics and personal finance. And in fact, this body adopted state academic standards for econo economics and personal finance in 2011. Uh, these new standards include standards and benchmarks at each grade level, uh, K through 12. And the standards and benchmarks in personal finance fall within the economic standards. The problem is, however, that some uh, teachers may not be adequately prepared or, as some have expressed to me, uh, lack confidence in, t in the ability to effectively instruct their students in these topics. Economics and finance are typically taught at the high school level uh, by secondary social studies teachers. And while Minnesota produces an abundance of teachers prepared in history, political science, geography, and other social sciences, uh, only 2% of social studies teachers focused on economics in their undergraduate preparation. Uh, one metric is that high school social studies teachers can be and are prepared uh, to call upon uh, to teach economics at any time, and many of them have never taken uh, one college course in either of these topics. Um, Senate, this Senate file would appropriate from a consumer financial literacy education fund, 
within commerce is uh, $50,000 annually over the next two years to the Commissioner of Education to provide a grant to MCEE to partially support MC MCEE to continue <coughs> delivering a teacher development program aligned with state standards re related to personal finance uh, and to expand personal finance, professional development, uh, and teacher workshops uh, and courses. These workshops are offered in, in person in the Twin Cities at the two affiliated regional centers for education at St. Cloud State University, uh, at M MN State uh, University Mankato, and online statewide. The program includes the training of Master Teacher Corps to serve as instructors and mentors to their fellow K through 12 teachers throughout the state. Uh, these accomplished teachers train other teachers both in subject matter, content, and in effective classroom implementation of economics and personal finance license. And with me uh, here, Chair, uh, are some testifiers on this bill. Thank you, Senator Song. We do have a short list of testifiers, and we will start with Dr. Julie Bond. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Good afternoon, Claire, Chai, Claire Chair Klein and members. My name is Julie Bunn. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Council on Economic Education, and I've served in this role since the fall of 2018. Shortly, you'll hear from some of MC's partners in promoting personal financial literacy education in Minnesota, but I want to speak briefly to three goals. First, to provide you a brief overview of MMC's history and what we do. Secondly, to explain the foundational nature of our organization and what it does in the financial literacy space, and to briefly explain the request before you today and what it's intended to be used for. Uh, first of all, on the history. We have existed now for 61 years. We were founded by a coalition of uh, academics, uh, business people, and labor people to improve the financial and economic literacy of all Minnesotans and to make them more literate in this complex world in which they have to cope and thrive. Um, it's a public-private partnership. And from the outset, the Minnesota Council was uh, one of the leading councils in the nation and was for all the decades of existence and did many things that were unique to councils in the country. And other states developed their councils and their work based on the standard and the bar that Minnesota set for the work of these organizations. We leverage resources through a network of state centers for economic education that Senator uh, Zhang referred to at public and private institutions of higher learning and through connections with other state councils and centers around the country. MC delivers on this, mission, this mission by training teachers, and that's 85% of what we do, but we also engage students directly through competitions, CAP students' experiences, and summer uh, college and financial literacy readiness programs. But among these pathways, the teaching, the teaching the teachers and making sure they understand personal finance con concepts and consumer education concepts is our number one task before us. We target in this work um, the 1,600 new teachers coming out of our pre-service programs every year that may be asked to teach economics or personal finance as part of their career. In addition to the 25,000, which is you know almost half a Minnesota teachers that may also be asked to teach one or both of these subjects over the course of the career. Historically, we've trained uh, 500 to 700 teachers a year. During these last three years of the pandemic, our numbers actually went way up. And they were between 1,200 and over 2,000 teachers per year for sh now shorter things, webinars, shorter experiences, and, uh, uh, and virtual experiences. But we're now returning to hybrid and in person as well. We're an organization. We're a mean and mighty entrepreneurial organization. We only have four full-time staff. We do our work by mobilizing a faculty uh, affiliate institutions of higher education around the state a cores of master teachers that we train and that work with us, um, and also experts on a contract basis as needed to be the instructors and planners for our workshops and programming. We teach these teachers through multiple means, in the pre-service programs before they have degrees, at the beginning of their careers when they need multi-day intensive training, and throughout the course of their careers to sharpen their school skills and update their knowledge when new knowledge and new techniques are made available, and also introduce them to special topics. We also have an annual conference that includes the personal finance and uh, gives awards to teachers for uh, uh, demonstrating their skill and their achievements in personal finance education. The request before you today uh, on this 
professional revenue account within the Commerce Department is for just $50,000 a year, a two-year grant, to focus specifically on the personal finance aspects of our activities. We did receive a grant for two years, uh, two years ago from this committee, a broader basis for our activities for $150,000 a year. We're just asking this year for this narrow work on our personal finance portion of our programming that really addresses the consumer education piece of what we do. In terms of the two-year grant that we're still under the second year of, we are reporting to the state, to the Commissioner of Education, uh, twice a year on that grant, midterm and end of year. And just yesterday, the chair and the, and the minority lead were given, uh, delivered to their offices, um, the report um, from the end of last year on that grant was available <coughs> to any of you digitally at any time upon request. Um, so that work continues this year, and we've had great success over this last year in advancing our programming. Specific in this personal finance literacy space, uh, as Senator uh, Zhang mentioned, we address the need to train people to teach the personal finance standards. Uh, in addition to with, within the social studies, there are also life skills class, family and consumer science teacher classes, and business classes that teach personal finance, and we train the teachers in all of these areas. All of them attend our programming and take part and take advantage of the resources available free of charge to them through our website to teach all these courses. So Minnesota, the MCE serves a fundamental mission, mission a core mission to the K-12 space in Minnesota. We curate materials, we develop materials, we provide the student supplementary competitions, and we also, in addition to that, train the staff of community-based nonprofits to deliver financial literacy education to their clientele. In this, we partner with national organizations, uh, National Council of Economic Education, the Federal Reserve Bank System, Next to Personal Finance, and others to make sure we have the very best materials available for our teachers and we bring it to them and teach them how to use these materials effectively. We also engage people from the financial and financial advising sectors in our work and in helping us do what we do the very best we can. We're now ex entering a very exciting period for our organization of our state in that we've made the decision to develop a voluntary certification program that will be free of charge or extremely low cost to teachers to do a more in-depth um, study of economics and personal finance. And this spring, we are forming a work group of academics, teaching professionals, and experts from the private sector in these industries to develop a 40, 50 hour certification course. This work is a, will be a key focus of what the support for this funding will be used for over the next two years. So we have a unique role in this space because we're focused on teachers. There are other organizations that focus on students using corporate volunteers. We are the only group that's focusing on the teachers and providing the resource they need to do what they do. We appreciate your support of this effort. We ask that you um, support this initiative, and we're glad to take any questions from you and us, and following will be, will be some of our supporters. In your packet, there's further information, including more testimony from students and teachers related to our programming and additional information, and also my contact information. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Dr. Bunning. Could we have both Mr. Redelsheimer and Dr. Hybert come to the table? And Mr. Redelsheimer, you can proceed, introduce yourself for the record, and proceed with your testimony. Uh, dear members of the Senate Commerce Committee, my name is James Redelsheimer, and I'm an economics teacher at Armstrong High School in Plymouth, the author of Barron's AP Economics Review Textbook, and a master teacher with the Minnesota Council of Economic Education. I'm here today to urge your support uh, to, uh, for the MCE by providing funding for their exceptional teacher training and offerings in personal finance. When I began teaching 20 years ago, uh, the MCE was the first people I reached out to to give me the training and um, it was invaluable in helping me navigate my first years of teaching. Um, I'm proud today to be a MCE master teacher, who is, uh, which I never thought I would be at the time when I started 20 years ago, but it's great to work with an outstanding group of master teachers uh, to help the next uh, generation of teachers uh, provide this uh, valuable um, education in teaching personal finance. The MCE provides exceptional training and guidance for teachers in a variety of ways, from one-hour webinars, multi-day workshops, covering everything from core materials to special and current hot topics such as a webinar I did on understanding Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. The resources are curated from the best in personal finance education, 
from MCEE's own materials, as well as those from the National Council of Economic Education, the Federal Reserve Bank, next-gen personal finance, and other sources around the country. This ensures that teachers receive the most up-to-date and comprehensive training available. As we know, many new teachers lack the necessary training to teach personal finance effectively. This is where MCEE comes in. They provide these teachers with the tools they need to inspire their students to become financially literate, make informed decisions about their finances, and prepare for college and career. MCE's teacher training offerings are a critical resource for our state's education system. Providing funding for the MCEE means supporting the growth of our state's economy, preparing our students for success. It's an investment in our state's future that will pay dividends for years to come. In conclusion, I urge you to support the funding for the Minnesota Council on Economic Education. The resources and training they offer are critical to ensuring that our students receive the education and economic and financial literacy they need to succeed. Thank you for your time and consideration. Well, thank you, Mr. Rettelsheimer. Dr. Hybert, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Senator Klein, and it's actually Hebert, but that's okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, I'm Dan Hebert, and I am the CFP Certified Financial Planner, uh, fi uh, Financial Planner Program Director at Minnesota State Mankato. Uh, we have a CFP board certified program that provides the education requirements for students to achieve their CFP designation. Right now we have about 138 students in that program. So we're training uh, those students to become financial planners out in the field in the profession. We're one of the largest in the country. Uh, we started in 1997, so we were one of the first to get started. And we also urge you to support the MCEE as well. They provide a tremendous resource to high school students, some of the work that James does and others. How we support the program for the MCEE is really in two ways. One is that, as Julie mentioned, there is a, finance, a personal finance uh, decathlon competition that's a statewide high school competition for schools to come in and compete and our students here at Minnesota State Mankato in the program develop those cases. So they go to work, they develop those cases, uh, they help students, um, you know, again, just improve their skills from financial education and literacy. Um, and once the competition starts, our students also serve as judges. So they will uh, provide critiques and evaluations, um, and again, just really kind of furthers that um, um, relationship between our college and the high school students. They give great feedback, our students do, and they're really impressed too. If you ever want to see some great competitions by some really talented high school kids, make sure you check it out. It's just a fantastic competition. Um, we also have, as Julie mentioned, a MCEE regional chapter at Minnesota State. Um, so we also, again, kind of support the MCEE in that way as well. We also look forward to furthering our uh, partnership and relationship with the MCEE by doing maybe some workshops and collaborating along those lines. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hebert, and apologies for the mispronunciation. <laughs> That's okay. I have a call first. I appreciate your testimony. As you clear the table, if I could have Mr. Bill Schweitz come to the table. And uh, Ms. Mai Yang, could you please introduce yourself for the record and proceed? Thank you, Senator Klein. My name is Mai Yang, and I'm a certified financial planner as well as the Director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion and on the board of the Financial Planning Association of Minnesota. My interest in personal finance um, really started as early as when I was in eighth grade, when I first learned how to balance a checkbook in my math class. And I continued really to build my knowledge from there. Today, I'm a professional working with young physicians and helping them navigate through student loan debt, purchasing their first home, and saving for retirement. Looking back, my education did exactly what it should have. It helped me support wealthy, mostly white Americans. When we look at how culturally diverse Minnesota is compared to the other states, Minnesota is right around you know, the middle, so around 25, 26, as far as diversity goes. However, the MCE has led the way nationally among state councils in developing materials for and delivering workshops on culturally responsive personal finance education. I am thankful that I'm able to support 
my clients today. However, I am embarrassed to say that I have little knowledge and experience helping those in my own community. Now I'm having to make up for it by learning through helping my parents because they're at that age where they need my assistance and they really don't have access to a financial advisor or other resources. Growing up as a second generation Hmong American, adjusting to the American culture was my priority like many other Hmong Americans and therefore our own experiences were often forgotten. MCEE's culturally responsive personal finance education materials will help make sure students won't have to choose between two cultures as both can coexist, resulting in more engagement and retention of information. Additionally, as Julie Bunn has mentioned, the MCEE has been a leader in facilitating statewide discussion about the need for more equity and access to personal finance education in K through 12. I'm especially um, passionate about this as I feel fortunate that when I was in high school, I received some financial education, which really led me to where I am today as a financial planner. My parents didn't have the resources to help me, and I didn't realize that outside of the school system, there were resources, and so I relied on the school system to provide me with that education. My future would look very different from what, what it is today. All Minnesota students deserve the same opportunity for success, and it starts with providing our teachers with the resources to do what they do best. And I hope that you will support us. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Yang. And Mr. Bill Schweitz will be our last testifier. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Chairman Klein and members of the committee, my name is Bill Schweitz. I represent the Minnesota Mortgage Association as a volunteer. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. The Minnesota Mortgage Association is the only statewide organization that represents mortgage lenders. Mortgage lenders fund the consumer education account. A portion of the annual fees that we pay to the Commissioner's Special Revenue Fund is credited to the consumer education account. So it is important to us that those funds are used to educate consumers in a purposeful way. We support Senate File 1461 as long as the funds are explicitly used to support the training of teachers for a required personal finance course as proposed in Senate File 901. Uh, for reference, Senate File 901 is described as the personal finance class for graduating from high school requirement. It would be hard for us to support Senate File 1461 if the $100,000 appropriation is not contingent upon a personal finance class for graduation from high school requirement. It would seem unwise to appropriate the funds to train teachers to teach a class that may never be taught. <laughs> Those of us in the mortgage industry, in real estate, and in financial professions can't stress enough how important it is to educate our children in the basics of personal finance. I'm a 40-year veteran of the mortgage industry, and I've worked with thousands of borrowers. And it's so sad to see how some people get off their financial life on the wrong foot simply because they didn't know any better. I'm sure we might all be familiar with the story of the young college student that applied for a credit card just to get a free t-shirt and then charged it to the max, never considering how the repayments were to be made. An even more dire situation is the student loan crisis. Can you imagine what might have been avoided if our graduating seniors knew enough to consider the costs of college and not just the benefits? And on a personal note, my wife and I have raised five children. They all received a great education here in Minnesota, but we were keenly aware that they, were no, they had no instruction in personal finance. Fortunately, I was able to use my profession to ex and experience to guide our children. But not every family has the ability to share that expertise. In this case, education can be a great equalizer. Again, the Minnesota Mortgage Association supports Senate File 1461 if the funds are used to train teachers to teach a required course in personal finance. As written, this bill funds the grant to train teachers, but does do nothing to improve the financial literacy of our youth. Thank you. Thank you to all the testifiers. And in, in, in brief response to Mr. Schweitz's last comment, the next stop for this committee will be an education policy, excuse me, for this bill will be an education policy where such a requirement could be considered. 
Um, any response from the testifiers? Dr. Bunn. Yes, um, Chair Klein and members, just when I respond, I want to thank Mr. Uh, Schweitz for speaking on behalf of the Mortgage Association, because he's correct, that's the source of the funding for the special revenue account. I want to uh, address a couple things he raised. First of all, as I alluded to, first of all, MC supports uh, a personal finance required at high school level. We are part of a broad-based coalition to advance that legislation this session. In fact, we are the facilitator for the work of the coalition and the teacher organizations that formed a work group this last year to work on drafting a bill for that purpose. So we have been at the uh, very crucial and a central role in that process. Secondly, I referred to at the uh, in my remarks that what we see the primary use of this funding for the, la for the next two years, and it will take more than this amount of funding to do it, is to um, put together work groups starting this spring of members from uh, higher education experts, uh, master teachers in the classroom that are teaching personal finance, and um, industry experts to develop a 40 to 60 hour, 50 hour course, which would be a certification course, which would be one of the several pathways Minnesota's teachers could use to be qualified to teach the required personal finance course at the high school level. So this grant is going to make sure we have a one of several options available to Minnesota teachers to qualify to teach such a course uh, when it uh, when if it comes to being. Um, uh, such a, such a course, such a training course uh, is necessary in our view to be developed next few years whether or not this particular session uh, that bill is passed, we hope that it is, but it, we we're going we're to develop it anyways because we do have many high schools in the state, not, we only about 7% of students take in the state that take any kind of freestanding course related to personal finance or less than that, but that's still a significant number of uh, students in the state. And those teachers are still being trained by us, and we want to offer them a more in-depth training. That training will include things related to housing and mortgages and credit and all those things that relate to the mortgage industry and other financial uh, arrangements that um, individuals at various phases of their life will help to take on. So I guess the sum of my comment is that I would hope that um, um, uh, uh, the members here and also the Morgan session would see the value of moving forward with this project to develop this training course, including all three of the individuals here we're hoping will be part of that work group uh, in, the, in the coming two years um, as a not only a preparation for a future possible required course, but also to have a stronger basis of a course training course for those teachers who are going to teach it anyways. We have about 30 districts in the state. It's a small number of all the districts in the state. We're in the 300 range, 500 if you count charter schools in the state districts. We have 30 districts in the states that already require a course in personal finance. So uh, those teachers would get training through this course and these means as well. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bunn. Senator Zhang. Oh, and uh, thank you, Chair, uh, Chair Klein. Uh, but maybe, maybe Ms. Bunn can uh, elaborate a little bit more on what the funding is, is will be going to be used for and how the, you know, how the request came about. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Um, Bond. Yeah, so this funding, in addition to um, training programs we already have in existence, will be offered next summer, uh, one to three hour to one day trainings in personal finance over the next two years that we would be doing anyways. As I mentioned, we're forming this work group. The goal of that work group will be to design a $45 course that would align with the national standards for personal finance that were established in 2022 by the National Council of Economic Education and the National Jumpstart Organization. Those are very comprehensive standards for personal finance at the high school level. Um, all the teacher groups we work with over the last eight months, which include the business teachers, the facts teachers, and the social studies teachers, all looked at many, many different sets of standards for personal finance and agreed that that particular set of standards was by far the best and our state should adopt it if we have a required course. And we are going to develop this training course to align with those standards so all our teachers have the most comprehensive, highest quality um, training in this over the next couple of years. We'll go to a member questions and comments. Senator Howe. Thank you, Chair Klein. And I guess first I'd like to find out from staff, uh, where does the consumer education account money come from? It's a special revenue fund. Mm -hmm. So where does that money come from to go into that fund? Ms. Grinnell. <laughs> Sorry about that. Mr. Chair and members, um, 
under Minnesota statute 5010, um, it looks like residential mortgage fees, um, excuse me, residential mortgage originator licenses, um, 50, Fifty dollars from that is credited to, to the consumer education account and special revenue fund, and then another fifty is taken from renewal licenses. I believe that's all that's showing up in the statute, um, but maybe the author or the testifier can uh, talk to that more. Sarah that's, John. That's yeah. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Ms. Brunn. That's correct. This was uh, this special revenue account was created, I believe, in about 2001 with an amendment on a banking bill. My understanding is, um, yes, and it, that $50 annual fee is 50 of a $500 fee, so it's a 10% of the fee they would pay goes into the special revenue fund. I should add to that, there have been conversations among industry people and also at Commerce the last two years about the fact that our state, unlike many states and the treasurer's offices, which we don't have, um, do a lot of work in the financial literacy space and have funds for that purpose. Um, we do not have such a structure in our state, but we do have this one fund that essentially, from what I can tell, set unused for 18 years. Um, that um, I don't know what happened to it the first 10 years. My guess is it, it went to pay for the deficit in 2007 through 9 or 10, uh, but it has been unused until this time. And so I think there are discussions about a more appropriate way that it shouldn't just be mortgage brokers, <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, underwriting these kinds of activities and, and perhaps not at that level of fees either. Uh, and that if we have such a structure with a special revenue account for financial literacy education grants, that um, it might should be something that uh, many sectors of the financial, real estate, insurance industries pay into, but that's a larger vision for perhaps next year. It's under discussion. Senator Howell. <laughs> and thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess the follow-up I had on that was exactly what was the, in when, when they established that, what was the intent of the use of that money before we got into a long conversation? But mm -hmm. was there anything in the legislation or anything in the, in the law that said what the intent of the use of those funds would be used for? Mr. Hoodle. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, we can look into that. Um, I don't see anything in the statute necessarily related to intent, but uh, Mr. Hudal and I can look into the legislation and, and get back to you. Thank you. And, and so with that, uh, I guess, how many years have, uh, have we been using this uh, fund or you have been getting grants, Ms. Dr. Bunn, uh, because you've been here, you've been in existence for 61 years. Mm -hmm. Have you been getting grants for 61 years? Mm -hmm. Dr. Bunn. Thank you, um, Chair Klein. Um, to the first question you raised about the intent of it, um, we did research the intent of it, and the intent was for um, consumer literacy, consumer protection, um, education. The intent was to give it as grants to nonprofits to do this work. So um, we felt from the outset when we saw it, given that language about its intent, that we we were right in line with the intent of the original legislation to give grants to nonprofits for this kind of work. To your question of have we been getting grants, um, our organization uh, started coming to the legislature for funding like this starting in 2019. Uh, once before that, we had a, before my time, there was a grant for specific um, curriculum projects that had been developed. Um, that the state helped fund over a period of a couple years. Other than that, I think for 57 or eight years, we did not receive a dime from the state, which raises the question of why we are here now asking for state money starting in 2019. And the reason is, and I didn't expect to share this in this committee, but I know that the education, people in education, the reason is over a period of about eight years from 2010 to 18, the three primary sources of our funding collapsed. Um, so what it supported us for 50-something years, that model began to break down. The three sources were in-kind support from higher education. Um, colleges and universities gave release time to faculty members to serve as uh, my role as a council director and also as center directors around the street state to work on uh, doing professional development with K-12 teachers and directing cur curriculum. 
because of the cuts to higher education over a period of about 15, 20 years, um, all that support from higher education, which was about 25 to 30 percent of our budget over all those years, disappeared within five years of my coming before I came. The second source of funds is we had received some federal No Child Left Behind fund that came through the state to us to do teacher training. When that program was changed, the new version of it, uh, no longer available to organizations like us. And the third thing was the we all those years, 55 years, 60 years, we rely primarily on uh, foundation, corporate and family foundation grants. And the corporate foundation sector changed dramatically in its giving over those years to be uh, more focused and more specific. And since we serve all teachers and all students in Minnesota, we no longer fit their cri criteria for being on only underserved populations or only low income or only subsets of the population, and they said they did not want to fund teacher development. The loss of those three funds uh, did bring us to look for alternative sources, including um, temporary and longer term sources from the state of Minnesota. Senator Hall. Thank you, uh, Chair Klein. And, and so, you know, I'm not a, opposed to this, but I guess. Uh, I've been, you know, I've, I've gone to numerous schools in my district that actually do a fantastic job with teaching mm -hmm. these courses. And uh, some of them go a step further and actually have an entrepreneur class where they actually uh, have businesses and they start businesses and they sell stuff and make profit and, mm -hmm. and do an excellent job. So I, the, the training is outstanding. I guess because you're, a, you know, and I'm not opposed to, to doing this, but I would, I would say that, you know, because you're a 501c3 and you're teaching finance and you're in that realm, I can't understand why there's not uh, all kinds of outfits looking to give you a tax deductible donation to, to fund this effort instead of, of, of taking tax dollars mm -hmm. and putting it here. Uh, so that's... Mm -hmm. That's my opinion. I, I don't. I see it's a a, law, a, a missed opportunity uh, out there. But uh, the training is excellent. I, I don't have any doubts there uh, that it's being put to good use. I just uh, I would say that uh, because you're a non-taxable nonprofit, 501c3, uh, you would think that uh, these great financial uh, planners that uh, should be connected with all sorts of financial institutions that could use the tax break could make that happen. That's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Howe. Response from Senator Zhang? Um, thank you, uh, Senator Howe, uh, for that comment. And uh, thank you, Ms. Uh, Dr. Brun Bun. Um, I think this is a good good bill, uh, good opportunity to support uh, the financial literacy of our students here in this state. And I urge your support for this bill. Any other member comments or questions? Senator Frentz. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Zhang. I'm a yes vote on the bill, and I think in addition to the benefits that we've already discussed, greater financial literacy tends to deter fraud and make it harder mm -hmm. to achieve, so you mm -hmm. have that benefit, and you got my vote. Thank mm -hmm. you for bringing it forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Frentz. Senator Wicklund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to express my support. I, I see this as a, a it seems like a very good use of a modest amount of money to go towards this training. Um, and uh, I know from my experience with my own kids that there are things that I felt like I could provide advice on, but then there are a lot that, that I wasn't able to and all of the experiences that they've had with dealing with student loans, um, dealing with um, buying a house, um, you know, healthcare and health insurance, things like that. I just think we need to do a much better job with our our high school age students to help them understand these things before they're actually um, needing to, to deal with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So thanks for bringing it forward. Seeing no further uh, member questions or comments, the question is on the motion of Senator Seberger that Senate file 1461 be recommended to pass and refer to the Committee on Education Policy. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion prevails. Senate file 1461 is recommended to pass and is referred to the Committee on Education Policy. Members, the committee is adjourned. <laughs>